carbonate rocks and minerals play a huge role in controlling life on Earth, the climate of Earth, pretty much just everything. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about carbonate chemistry and mineralogy. And this is going to be the first in a series of carbonate petrology videos. I know I have one already out on my channel that was supposed to be a later video with the playlist, but I did it out of order. I'm sorry. And so this is actually the first and kind of introductory video for that playlist. And so I'll introduce the variety of carbonate minerals out there, their composition, their mineralogy, and what their significance is. Carbonate minerals form wherever water is super saturated or oversaturated with calcium and carbonate ions. Because in these conditions, calcium and carbonate are kind of forced to react and precipitate out or crystallize out of solution as a calcium carbonate mineral. Hi guys, Editing Rachel here. I just wanted to pop in for a second because I forgot to mention in the video that there are plenty of other carbonate minerals out there other than calcium carbonate. There's iron carbonate, magnesium carbonate, anything where there's a cation with a two plus charge pretty much can react with carbonate. And I'll talk more about those other carbonates in later videos in this playlist. But for this video and many of the videos, I will be focusing on calcium carbonate. So that's why I kind of focus on that in, in this video. All right, back to recording, Rachel. And this is not only a marine process. This is most common in shallow marine conditions, but can occur in lakes, rivers, springs, soils, and caves as well. Carbonate minerals are often altered by recrystallization, replacement, dissolution, cementation, and other processes during diagenesis. In other words, basically everything that happens to that mineral after it's formed, including its burial, compaction, and during these processes, it reacts with water and sediment pore spaces, and that's why it undergoes these diagenetic changes like you know, recrystallization and replacement and dissolution because it's still reacting with the solution. And the solution changes composition as the sediment is further buried and compacted and increases in depth, etc. Carbonate morphologies, even just among the minerals that have the composition calcium carbonate, are extremely diverse. So the calcium carbonate minerals can form a variety of different morphologies. Often this is facilitated by life because things like corals and mollusks and other organisms can secrete calcium carbonate as their skeletons. And of course, this has a very different morphology than crystalline or abiotically formed calcium carbonate minerals. So how is it that they form? Well, the actual chemical reaction that leads to precipitation, formation, and dissolution, the dissolving of calcium carbonate minerals, is shown here in which calcium carbonate reacts with water and CO2, which typically react to form carbonic acid, which dissolves calcium carbonate to form calcium and bicarbonate ions in solution. However, this direction of the formula is just the dissolution process. The opposite process, the leftward reaction, is the reaction that forms calcium carbonate. So it's a reversible reaction that can go both ways, just depending on the concentration of reactants. If you've got a ton of calcium and bicarbonate ions, the reaction will head over to the left to produce calcium carbonate. If there's a lot of CO2 and thus carbonic acid, as well as available calcium carbonate, the reaction will dissolve the calcium carbonate to disassociate those ions again. And the major thing in this formula that's changing and fluctuating all the time, affecting the precipitation and dissolution of carbonate minerals in the ocean and other water bodies, is CO2. CO2 fluctuations control this reaction's equilibrium because that's the major thing that is fluctuating. You're not getting a huge fluctuation in the amount of calcium carbonate in the ocean, at least not at a rate that would affect this reaction more so than CO2. So CO2 fluctuations are the main thing controlling the direction in which this reaction goes. CO2 addition drives dissolution and CO2 removal drives precipitation or formation. Temperature and pressure also affect the equilibrium of this reaction. Rising temperature and decreasing pressure promotes precipitation, and falling temperature and increasing pressure promotes dissolution. We can see in the graph down here in the middle, the calcium carbonate solubility, or kind of the likelihood that it becomes dissolved, goes up with increasing CO2 concentrations, but where this trend lies changes with temperature. So the solubility of calcium carbonate, in other words, is both CO2 and temperature dependent. 
And in the graph over here to the right, we have the saturation index for calcite and aragonite, which are both calcium carbonate minerals. They have the same formula, just different structures, plotted against depth within the ocean for the Atlantic and Pacific. And all you really need to know about this is that a one value of saturation is kind of where the boundary typically lies for dissolution and precipitation equilibrium. In other words, greater than one saturation leads to precipitation of calcite or aragonite, and less than one leads to dissolution. And so if we look at the trends with increasing depth, which is falling temperature and increasing pressure, this promotes the dissolution of calcite when it gets to around 4,000 meters depth. Aragonite, on the other hand, is less stable with respect to increasing pressures and falling temperatures, and it will begin to dissolve around one to 2,000 meters depth. And these depths actually correspond to what's called the aragonite compensation depth and calcite compensation depth. These represent the depths at which aragonite and calcite will begin to dissolve respectively. And they're different for both minerals. And they're also different spatially across the globe, depending on where you are in the ocean, the depth of the ocean, the temperature, the pressures, the chemistry, how much CO2 is available, all of these things. They also have varied temporally throughout Earth's history because all of those things have continued to change within the ocean throughout Earth's history. Biology or life can also affect the equilibrium of this reaction and thus the precipitation and dissolution of calcium carbonate. Organisms can either directly or indirectly induce precipitation. Organisms that do this directly can actually take up calcium and carbonate ions into their cells where they have certain vacuoles that are specialized for kind of concentrating calcium carbonate enough in order to get it saturated so that they can secrete it as their shells or skeletons. There are also organisms, particularly microbes, that can indirectly induce precipitation by increasing pH alkalinity leads to the precipitation of calcium carbonate because it leads to more uh, bicarbonate and carbonate ions available for calcium to react with, whereas low pH promotes the conversion of these ions to just CO2. And there are organisms that can increase the pH to the point that induces calcium carbonate precipitation. I have a few videos about biomineralization talking about how organisms can directly precipitate and indirectly induce the precipitation of minerals like calcium carbonate as well as plenty of other minerals if you're interested in seeing how that works. So now moving to carbonate mineralogy. Basically what are the minerals of calcium carbonate and why are they different structures and how does this affect their formation and kind of behavior in the environment? Well there are six polymorphs of calcium carbonate. In other words six minerals that have this calcium carbonate composition, but they're all classified as different minerals because they have different structures. Calcite and aragonite are the most commonly talked about ones because they're also the most dominant biogenic and abiogenic deposits of calcium carbonate. In other words, calcium carbonate minerals that are produced by biology or abiotic processes are typically aragonite or calcite. These other three crystalline forms of calcium carbonate are rare, and this last one, this amorphous calcium carbonate, so non-crystalline, non-structured calcium carbonate mineral, can be found in some skeletons of echinoids, corals, microbes, and other types of organisms, but tends to rapidly transform to aragonite or calcite. So why do these polymorphs exist? Why does it form so many different structures? Well, typically carbonate minerals are stable as hexagonal in their kind of structure, their mineral structure, if the ionic radius of the cation is less than 0.99 angstroms, whereas orthorhombic carbonate minerals are stable if the ionic radius of the cation in the structure is over 0.99 angstroms. Calcium two plus ions, the ones that form calcium carbonate minerals, are right at 0.99 angstroms in ionic radius, meaning that depending on the ambient conditions, either hexagonal or orthorhombic calcium carbonate can form. But this is not the case for other carbonate minerals that contain ions that are either much larger or much smaller than calcium. 
calcium is just at this perfect size that makes it really versatile in terms of the crystal lattice structures that it can form. Now, manganese two plus ions are sometimes substituted into calcium carbonate minerals like calcite. Aragonite cannot fit manganese into its structure because the manganese ion is just too small for the orthorhombic structure of aragonite's mineral lattice. Calcite can fit manganese into its structure, and the amount of manganese that gets substituted for calcium ions within calcite's mineral structure depends on the ambient seawater manganese to calcium ratio so the relative amount of manganese and calcium in the seawater. I'm sorry, I just realized that I've been saying manganese, not magnesium. <laughs> I've been working with manganese oxides recently, and it's the thing that's in my brain. Manganese is MN. Magnesium is the thing I'm talking about here, not manganese at all. Um, they're very different things. So magnesium is the cation that I am talking about here, and the relative magnesium to calcium ratios are what matter in terms of how much magnesium gets incorporated into calcite. If enough magnesium is incorporated into the calcite structure, it is called high magnesium calcite, or HMC. If the magnesium calcium ratio is about 50-50, and it's structured in alternating layers of calcite, magnesium, calcite, magnesium, this is called stoichiometric dolomite. Oftentimes, we still call a 50-50 ratio of magnesium to calcium dolomite, even when it's not stoichiometric or perfectly alternating layers, but the stoichiometric kind is like alternating layers of 50-50 calcite magnesium. So because calcite can incorporate magnesium and aragonite cannot, one would assume that high ratios of magnesium to calcium in the ocean would favor calcite formation and low ratios would favor aragonite. But that's not actually the case. High magnesium to calcium ratios over about two favor high magnesium calcite formation and aragonite formation. And this typically occurs during periods of slow seafloor spreading. In other words, seafloor spreading at mid-ocean ridges where the crust is pulling apart, allowing new crust material to come up from the mantle. That is where we get the hydrothermal alteration of the crust from hot waters flowing through it. And this decreases the magnesium calcium ratio of the ocean because magnesium gets substituted into the places of those you know, basaltic rocks often. So a slow seafloor spreading period in Earth's history would correspond with a high magnesium to calcium ratio and vice versa. And while high magnesium calcium ratios favor high magnesium calcite and aragonite formation, Low magnesium calcium ratios during periods of high rates of seafloor spreading favor low magnesium calcite and do not favor aragonite formation. So it's mainly just calcite forming during those periods. The modern ocean magnesium to calcium ratio is relatively high and thus favors high magnesium calcite and aragonite formation. This typically means that even organisms during these periods produce mainly high magnesium calcite and aragonite. And then in periods of low magnesium to calcium ratios produce mainly low magnesium calcite. However, not all organisms that secrete hard parts like this actually follow these rules. Some organisms on modern Earth are actually currently producing low magnesium calcite. But how is this possible if that's not favored? Normally, very high energy intensive processes are not favored by the organism. They'd rather do the easy thing, the more thermodynamically favorable mineral to precipitate at the time. Well, some organisms create microenvironments favorable for other structures. In other words, the little environment either within their cell or within their communities of cells, if they excrete some sort of extracellular polymeric substances that hold their community together, they can form what are called microenvironments, where they kind of alter the conditions to the point that's favorable for them. Very similar to how we air condition our indoor spaces, and we create these environments that are favorable for us. Same thing goes for these organisms. They can create environments in which they take in calcium and carbonate ions, but exclude magnesium things like that. Why do they do this if, if it technically, you know, requires more energy? Well, it's uncertain, but it's likely due to when these organisms evolved. Organisms produce the mineral that best suits their needs at the time that they evolve. 
However, this means that they undergo expansion and declines with changing seawater magnesium to calcium ratios. Sorry, that's supposed to say seawater, not sweater. <laughs> an example of an organism like this is low magnesium calcite producing coccolithophores, which evolved in the Mesozoic, I think the Jurassic, but they kind of went crazy with diversification and expansion in the Cretaceous. And the vast around 100 million year old chalk deposits are actually from coccolithophore deposits at the time, and it was due to the low magnesium to calcium ratio of seawater at the time that allowed them to spread so vastly. Today, they still produce low magnesium calcite, but they have actually declined today because the modern ocean is favoring high magnesium calcite rather than low. However, some coccolithophores have been shown to produce high magnesium calcite under modern conditions and low magnesium calcite under synthetic Cretaceous-like conditions in which we lower the magnesium to calcium ratio to the point that low magnesium calcite is favorable. These coccolithophores that can adapt like this are likely the ones that survived the changing seawater composition. Another thing that magnesium affects is the solubility of calcium carbonate minerals like calcite. The more magnesium and calcite structure, the less stable and the more soluble the mineral is. Aragonite and high magnesium calcite have similar solubilities. And as we saw on one of the previous slides about calcite compensation depth versus aragonite compensation depth, aragonite is much more soluble than calcite typically is. So the fact that high magnesium calcite has a solubility similar to aragonite means that that magnesium content really increases the solubility of calcite given that most of the time calcite is much more stable and less soluble than aragonite. Dolomite, however, is a little different. Dolomite's 50-50 magnesium calcium ratio and its stoichiometric alternating layers of calcium and magnesium leads to the most durable structure of them all and thus it's the least soluble of these three minerals. So now that we've discussed the chemistry, the formation, the dissolution, and the mineralogy and the structures of calcium carbonate minerals, we can now move on to the other really important questions regarding carbonate minerals, including where are carbonates produced and what kinds of environments, and has this changed throughout Earth's history? What produces most carbonates, microbes, animals, abiotic processes, and has this changed throughout Earth's history? How do non-marine carbonates form? How do caves and sinkholes form, which is a fun one? And how do we classify the large variety of carbonate minerals out there? These are the questions that I will cover for the rest of this carbonate petrology playlist. And if you want to check out one that talks about how the production of carbonates has changed throughout Earth's history in terms of being abiotic versus biological, I actually already made that video and it is out now on my channel. I will link it right up here for you guys if you want to check it out. And as always, my references are linked down below in the description box. And with that, Thank you so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye.